Hey everybody, good morning. Welcome to First Thing. I am Katie Conrad and I am the content designer here at First Church. Good morning, I'm Ben and I am the director of connections here at First Church. Yes. I see we got people hopping in on in the chat. So thanks for joining us. We got Bob and Luann, we got Ken and Jacko. Uh, Hello. Conda from Michigan. Hey, hey, oh. thanks for joining us this morning and happy Father's Day. Yes, happy Father's Day. The Caminis and Michelle are also in. Yes. So thanks for joining us and for, for those of you who are just hopping in now. Um, do you want to start with your history lesson? Oh, sure. Okay. I was curious about the origins of Father's Day just because it, you know, it's sparked my curiosity. And so I found out that the kind of inciting incident to install Father's Day as like a, an official holiday was a woman, actually, um, by the name of Sonora Smart Dodd was inspired to create a Father's Day because at the time Mother's Day was already a thing. Hmm. Um, she attended a Mother's Day church service actually and was inspired to like, hey, why isn't there a Father's Day? And that was around like 1909, 1910. And um, she was actually the daughter of a Civil War veteran named Jackson Smart. Hmm. And I think the reason it was so impactful for her to create this Father's Day was that she was, um, her dad raised her and her five siblings as a single father. So I would imagine that she wanted to right. honor her father in that way, which is just wow. very lovely. I never knew that that... Yeah. Yeah, I never really knew what came first, if like Mother's Day and Father's Day were just kind of instilled in the same timeline yeah. or what came first. So that's interesting. I, I wonder if, I mean, that's like a strictly American thing. I wonder if other uh, nations do Father's Day or Mother's Day too. I don't know. Interesting. I also wonder like, how did Mother's Day come about then? If that oh. was longer than Father's Day, as it should be. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Very cool. Thanks Ooh. for the history lesson. Oh, it's yes. very interesting. Of course. Well, as y'all are logging in, it would be so helpful for us if you would take a, a second to fill out the connection card just to let us know that you're worshiping with us. It's also a great way to um, mention any prayer requests if you have any. But um, something really unique about this online experience is that at the very end, as we're, we're wrapping up before we get into the pre-recorded bit, is that Ben and I will lead a time in live prayer. So we would love to be praying with you and for these things that are kind of weighing on your heart or maybe things that are really exciting going on in your life that you want to celebrate. So if you have um, praises or prayer requests, feel free to put them in the chat below and we will keep an eye on them, write them down and pray for them later. Yeah, yeah. whatever you'd like to have us celebrate. And you know, there, there is a, a place to request private prayer if yes. that is something that you'd like as well. Mm -hmm. So today I think we'll go into housekeeping items, right? Some Other announcements. Yep. Yeah. So for announcements, oh, the big one that I've been chomping at the bit to talk about is Transform because I always like to talk about Transform. As you see, I've been wearing the Transform shirts for about, you know, four weeks now straight and I will continue to wear them. Transform, we do that every year. That's usually the first week in August. So this year the dates are July 31st through August 4th. And basically what that is is anyone from the community, nonprofits, homeowners, that kind of thing, can ask for some help. So it's really or, uh, oriented around nonprofits and older folks or folks who aren't either physically or financially able to keep up with their home and their yard work mm -hmm. and the safety issues in their house, that sort of thing. So we want to help them out. And so it's a really cool way. We just get the projects in, we design volunteer teams, and we kind of have this week where we go out and we do all these projects in the community. And we're already at like 25 projects that Ooh. have come in, which is awesome. Whoa. We probably expect that to be about 40 projects until like by the time that Transform actually hits sure. this year. Um, but now we're in the point where we, we could really use some volunteers. So if you can spare half a day or a day or as many days throughout the week as you would like, and you can paint or you can hedge trim or whatever it is that you feel like you can contribute um, everyone can have a place in transform so feel free to sign up or let me know if you have any questions email me personally but that's a big thing we do and the, the big why is just uh, we we love people mm -hmm. and we we love taking care of people who you know could use an extra helping hand and we feel like that's part of what it means to be a community oriented around the love of christ so it's a really tangible, simple way of just going out and helping people. It is simple and it's also powerful. Just the stories that come from Transform of people who feel forgotten or lonely all of a sudden have five to seven people from their local church come up and being willing to help them out for no cost, for no reason other than we just care about you. You know, I mean, that, that's transformative. Uh -huh. So join and feel free to uh, let me know if you have any questions. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, um... I'm just, what's coming to mind right now is like love translation almost. You know, it's mm. one thing to be able to like, you know, to encounter someone on the street and maybe share about like, hey, like Jesus loves you. And maybe mm. that doesn't quite translate like, okay, that's that's nice. Thank you. Have a good day. But 
another way to, to, to show love is to say like, hey, we see that you have this need and maybe you aren't able to handle it. Like, let us love you by by helping you out, by walking alongside you, by completing the project that's been such a hindrance to like your daily rhythm of life. Yeah. You know? So. Yeah, in word and deed, I think yeah. is how yeah. uh, scriptures put it. So Beautifully put. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I know that Transform, the uh, construction projects, the community isn't just the only way to get involved in Transform. There's also Kids Edition. Right? Yes, we do have Kids Edition. So the idea here is that we really care about our kids and we want a fun project space for our kids to be involved in. So there will be projects where they get to tackle as well. So Courtney and Amy are putting on a really great Kids Edition. And ideally what that means is if you are a parent and you want to volunteer for Transform, but you have kids, that's a way for your children to have um, childcare for the day, a safe place to go, and then you can go to the project and then come and pick your kids up at the end of the day. But that's for Tuesday and Thursday of the Transform week. But we could use some volunteers for that as well who are just able to kind of like hang out with the kids and, yeah. and help with projects throughout the day. Um, yeah. That could help Courtney and Amy. So sign up for that as well if you want to spend half a day or a day helping with Kids Edition, that would be great. Yeah, that's a great way just for to like kind of teach our kids like this model that we are yeah. trying to embody ourselves, that they get the chance to also like get their hands dirty, make crafts, make gifts yeah. for people in our community. So just and it's an, it's an opportunity to show people what it means to look outward and look at other people and see like what needs do other people have. I think we live in a world that's very much like me, 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 and it kind of trains mm -hmm. us to look inward. And Transform is all about teaching kids and, and each other, like, it's time to look outward and see what needs we have in the world that we can contribute to. Yeah. Well, Michelle um, is giving you some gratitude. Thank you for your commitment to Transform, Ben. I'll just echo oh, that. Thanks. I know that your hard work is very um, appreciated and it's recognized. So thank thanks. you just for all the... Well, you know. it really is a great case of something that First Church has loved for years, long before my time. Uh, First Church has been doing Transform. And the only reason it happens is because there are many committed people. Mm -hmm. And so it's one of my favorite things because I get to, to join awesome people who are just passionate about it. So yeah. thanks for supporting. Yeah, thank you guys. Mm -hmm. um, really quickly, because uh, we almost forgot to mention, just if you would like to give, just know that mm -hmm. your giving supports many of the ministries here at First Church. And also if you utilize the second mile giving, it um, supports many ministries in our community. And the uh, second mile giving ministry for June is as Expectations, mm -hmm. which is pretty uh, timely, pretty, um, I don't know, funny timing, if you want to say that, considering today is Father's Day, that Expectations, yes, it's a women's center, but it supports families. It really um, does, yeah. Yeah, just starting out. I believe you attended... Um, yeah, recently I was able to go to, they had um, some of the local community partners come in and do a breakfast and a tour of the facility and just learn more about what Women's Expectation Center does. And they're just an awesome organization. It is a faith-based organization that does care for women who are pregnant. And specifically, one of the most powerful parts of their ministry is for people who are uh, abortion-minded. They are giving free um, care and options and trying to help them see options other than abortion and just let people know who are in really tough spots and think that maybe that's their only way forward, mm. that there are some other ways forward as well. And so just the amount of love and care and prayer that these people get um, who are in really tough situations. And it's not like this judgmental, like, why are you in this situation? It is very much this mm. um, passionate ministry around people who are just in tough spots. And the whole hope is how can we help these people move forward in a way that is that is for life. And um, mm. it's just awesome. So if you want to learn more about them, they can represent uh, the ministry better than I can. But they have a website, and they're just awesome people. So we're, we're glad to support them. What we do is um, just kind of uh, have a second mile giving option, which means that any uh, any contributions that you want to make to expectations can go directly to them rather than, you know, through the church ministries as well. So that's just a way that we can give extra support. Excellent. Yeah, mm -hmm. very true. So thanks for all the ways that you give of your time and your resources and your finances. Yeah. Michelle actually um, is a volunteer. Okay. So our, our host um, does a ton of volunteering for them. So if you have questions, she could probably uh, answer them better than we can. So thank you for supporting them, Michelle, and for being online today. So if there's anything you want to tell us about expectations, Michelle, feel free to drop in the chat. Mm -hmm. Thanks for bringing that up. Yeah. Okay. Um, we are about to enter our time of prayer. So I just, you know, give me a couple of minutes really quick if anyone wants to put in uh, last minute uh, praises or prayer requests in the chat. I did see 
from Jacko uh, continued prayers for Amy Peck in her healing, um, mm-hmm. that her body will accept this, the system cell treatment. We'll definitely be praying for that. As well as I think um, Father's Day is a really lovely day for people. And also I think it's a really hard holiday for some people. So we just want to be mindful of um, the highs and the lows that people may be feeling today. Mm-hmm. So do you have any other prayer requests, Ben? Uh, Continued prayers for Transform, and VBS is about to start as well. I know we got a lot going on this summer. Um, There's a lot happening at First Church, so just prayers that that will um, be a good time. And then prayers for expectations Mm. as well, just that their ministry would continue to thrive and be focused on um, on all the right things. That's a really good list. Um, We can keep an eye on that. Ben, would you mind starting us off and then I can wrap us up? Would you join with us in a word of prayer? God, we thank you for this day and we thank you for the celebration that is Father's Day and for the way that you do participate in our lives as a father. You are the father who provides for us and who directs us. And we just pray that we would be able to turn our eyes to you today. But also, Lord, we're grateful for our earthly fathers And Lord, for those who have good relationships or who are missing their fathers who are past today, uh, we just pray that you would be a comforting presence and that we would be able to celebrate today in the ways that are formative and meaningful and honoring. And God, we thank you for the ministries here at First Church. Lord, we thank you for things like VBS and for Transform and for the ways that we support expectations in other places. We just are just grateful for a congregation that wants to look outward and to contribute to a healthy community. Lord, we pray that that would continue and that today that you would be able to, whatever giving that we are able to give, that that would be multiplied and that that would be applied in all the best ways. Lord, that the energy around these events and these ministries would be one that is honoring and that the work that is done is a uh, work that has ripple effect, Lord, that it will help transform people who go out and help transform people mm-hmm. who go out and help transform people. Lord, we really do want our little corner of the world just to be benefited by the ways that we, we seek to pursue you. And we hope that that has a bigger in- impact than we can envision at the moment. Lord, we especially pray for Amy Peck right now mm-hmm. uh, and all of the ways in which her body is challenged by health issues, or especially for the, the stem cell um, system that, that her body is undergoing right now. Lord, we pray that in the ways that you do, that miracles will happen and that all the health professionals around her are wise and full of integrity and able to care for her in the best ways. And Lord, help us to continue remembering to pray for her day in and day out, that she has a community of support here at the church. Lord, it's in all of these ways that we pray in your name. God, I thank you for this day. I thank you for the chance to connect. Um, God, I thank you uh, that we get to highlight um, expectations this month. Um, What a lovely ministry. Um, And I recognize um, just the way that they are able to to come alongside people and to walk with them through a very stressful time potentially in their life. It's very exciting, but it also comes potentially with a lot of mixed emotions. So I just thank you for the ways that they are able to uh, minister to uh, to new families, to uh, moms and dads, and provide that kind of support. And I pray that uh, you can continue to support this uh, ministry. Um, please put the people who have passions for helping these, um, helping new moms and new dads, um, to expectations to continue this, um, to continue building this ministry out. Um, God, I pray that we could be, um, that you could open up our hearts and our minds and our spirits um, as we continue this sermon series on encounters with Jesus, that we could be open to new ways to encounter, uh, to encounter Jesus, to encounter true love and to be transformed by it. Thank you, God. It's in all this that I pray in your name. Amen. Amen. Cool. Thank you for joining us this morning. Really appreciate you being here. Uh, Feel free to stay engaged in the chat. I think we have a a whole service to look forward to, including a children's moment and music and a message. Um, Do we know what the message is going to be about? Can we spoil it or no? The Pharisees. It's about the Pharisees. They encounter Jesus quite often, and they're (laughs) quite great encounters. Um, So stick around, and feel free to drop in the chat if you have anything that you'd like to talk about. All right. Thanks. Hey everyone, you want to know what one of my favorite summer treats are? Watermelon. 
I love watermelon in the summertime, especially on a hot day. It's so good. It's sweet. It's really hydrating. Did you know that watermelon is 92% water? It's mostly made of water, which is why it's such a great thing on a hot day. It's also filled with vitamin C, which helps keep you from getting sick. It helps boost your immune system and it has antioxidants that help support your eyes. So that's a great thing to know. Now, all food is good food. It gives you energy. It helps out with different uh, boosts in your immune systems. It keeps you strong. And Jesus himself said that all food is good food. But in today's scripture, he didn't just teach us that food is good. Today, we're learning about Jesus in one of his interactions with the Pharisees, which are uh, one of the high priests of the time of Jesus during the New Testament. The Pharisees found Jesus and his disciple eating food. Not really that big of a deal, but the disciples didn't wash their hands before they ate their food. Now, we all know the importance of washing hands before eating. This way it keeps germs away, so that way we're safe and we don't get sick. In the time of Jesus, washing your hands was more of a ceremonial thing. It was a rule that was set during the Old Testament time or the time of Moses. And that rule made it so that you had to wash your hands so that you would become clean in order to eat your food in a way that would please God. The Pharisees saw Jesus' disciples and said, why haven't you washed your hands? Instead of answering the, the Pharisees, Jesus said this to them, you are nothing but show-offs. The prophet Isaiah was right when he wrote that God had said, all of you praise me with your words, but you never really think about me. It is useless for you to worship me when you teach rules made up by humans. You disobey God's commands in order to obey what humans have taught. You see, the Pharisees weren't actually concerned about the Jesus' disciples breaking God's rules. They were concerned about the fact that Jesus' disciples were breaking their rules, rules that were made by humans, not commands that were given by God. And Jesus pointed this out to them, saying, you guys, you guys are being hypocrites. You're saying one thing, but you're doing another. And that's not how God wants us to be. Later on, the disciples asked, can you explain that to us again? We aren't really sure what you meant when you told the Pharisees that. What did you mean, Jesus? So he said this to them. You surely know that the food that you put into your mouth cannot make you unclean. It doesn't go into your heart, but into your stomach and then out your body. And by saying this, Jesus meant that all foods were fit to eat. Then Jesus said, what comes from your heart is what makes you unclean. This is really important to know. Jesus told us, that it doesn't matter the food that you eat. Instead, it matters what comes out of your mouth because what comes out of your mouth is what comes out of your heart. So if you say things that are unkind or untrue, these are not good things. And these are what make you unclean to God. Now, remember all food is good food. Like I said before, it gives you energy, it keeps you strong, it boosts your immune system. And our words are like that too. If our words come from our heart and we think about God before we say it, then it'll be clean and good. Good for us and good for others. But if we don't think about God before we speak, then those words are unclean and they can hurt and they can do a lot of damage to you, to your friends, to your families, to anybody that you talk to. So remember to ask yourself this 
before you say something? Would God be happy with what I have to say? And if the answer is no, then you shouldn't say it. Will you pray with me? Dear God, thank you for being with us in our hearts and in our minds and in our soul. You give us strength every single day with the food that we eat, with the words that we read, with the interactions that we have. Help us to remember your thoughts, your heart, your words. Help us to speak only good things so that we can stay clean and lovely in your eyes. We ask all of this in your wonderful name. Amen. Savior, I come, quiet my soul, remember, redemption's hill, for your blood was spilled, for my ransom, everything I wanted. As we get ready to get into our message, I invite you to prepare your hearts by considering the following. 
You may want to get into a comfortable seated position, place your hand on your heart, or even close your eyes to help center yourself. In Mark chapter 7, we see a very different Jesus than what has been shown throughout the rest of this gospel. He is angry, using some very strong language to criticize the Pharisees. Jesus has very little patience for their hypocrisy and isn't afraid to tell them. Afterward, the disciples ask Jesus what exactly he meant. Jesus lays it out plainly for them. What comes out of a person is what defiles them. For it is from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come. These evils come from inside and defile a person. Consider how the following questions might apply to your life. What is the status of your heart at this very moment? Does it feel open? or closed off? Does it feel hardened because of someone or something? What in your life needs the healing power of Jesus to make clean? Hello everyone, I hope that you have had a great week. I know that for me, I've been grateful for some of the rain that we have had come recently because it was getting so dry out. Uh, and so I was grateful for that, but I was especially appreciative of how the rain came, at least most of the time. It came pretty slowly and then it just allowed for a deeper seeping in to the soil and to really let the, the soil soak it up. And I, I've really been grateful for that. And I just wanna invite us to think about that imagery here a little bit this morning. As we dive into God's word together, I wanna to invite us to do whatever we need to do now that we can slow down and pause and let it seep in to our hearts and into our souls that we might experience the life, the new life that God would have in store for us. So let's prepare our hearts to do that today. I invite us to hear today from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 7, verses 1 through 13. The Pharisees and some of the teachers of the law who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus and saw some of the disciples eating food with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. The Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they give their hands a ceremonial washing, holding to the tradition of the elders. When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And they observe many other traditions, such as the washing of cups, pitchers, and kettles. So the Pharisees and teachers of the law asked Jesus, why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders instead of eating their food with defiled hands? He replied, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites. As it is written, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. You have let go of the commands of God and are holding on to human traditions. And he continued, you have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your own traditions. For Moses said, honor your father and mother, and anyone who curses their father or mother is to be put to death. But you say that if anyone declares that what might have been used to help their father or mother is Corbin, that is devoted to God, then you no longer let them do anything for their father or mother. Thus you nullify the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down, and you do many things like that. Again, I invite us today to let those words begin to seep into our hearts. And as we do, would you join with me in a word of prayer? 
Almighty God, this day may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable in your sight, shaking us to new life in you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. As you might remember, if you have been journeying with us throughout the summer thus far, we are taking each week to look at different characters in the Gospels that Jesus has different encounters with. And we're meeting all kinds of different characters in this journey with Jesus throughout the summer. And part of what that's doing is it's letting us see different sides of Jesus himself. Because in some of those encounters, we see Jesus being compassionate, offering grace, extending welcome or healing or doing miracles. And so in a lot of those instances, we might see some of the kinder, maybe even gentler or nicer sides of Jesus. But we don't see that side of Jesus today. We can call Jesus lots of things, but today as he interacts with the Pharisees, sweet and kind are not terms that apply or describe Jesus. Because when we look at Jesus here today in this encounter where Jesus is encountering these Pharisees, you will see very quickly, we heard very quickly, that it doesn't fall into that sweet category. So I'm going to give us a heads up here today that it's one of those days we should maybe put a rating on the sermon and that we will call it intense. Uh, today is not going to be a fun-loving time, as it were, and I realize that's not always the most fun thing to hear, but what we are going to hear and what we are going to encounter is a sense of truth. And when we hear truth, truth ultimately sets us free, and truth leads to healing. And so I hope that we can receive that today, because we are going to seek substance over entertainment. And so when we come to this encounter here this morning, we see that the critics of Jesus are on the prowl again. And this time, they're doing their best to get him into a debate about Jewish purity laws and moral laxity. And in this case, it relates to not properly washing one's hands, not doing the ritual washing before a meal. Now, Washing our hands, that's not a foreign concept. We are familiar with that, especially if we've had kids or grandkids, nieces, nephews. We always have them wash their hands before they eat because who knows what they were playing with or doing before they came to the meal. And so we have them wash their hands out of a sense of concern for hygiene and not having germs in the eating. But that's not what the Pharisees are concerned about here today. They're not concerned about hygiene or germs. What they're concerned about is adhering to ritualistic religious purity and obedience to Old Testament scripture. If you ever want to learn more about the laws of purity, uh, go to books such as Leviticus or Numbers or Deuteronomy in the Old Testament, and you will hear a whole lot about these kinds of purity laws. Now, this may not sound like a very big deal to you and I, but this Torah, this Old Testament law described in places like Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy was understood to be a gift given by God to help God's people get closer to God. So obeying the law, adherence to the rituals, was seen as a way of preserving the people of God as a special and chosen people. You are probably familiar in our area of the Amish culture. The Amish stick to particular rules and rituals so that they can adhere to and hold their particular culture and way of being together. So they do things differently than you and I might in order to preserve that culture. Now, it doesn't mean that they don't have fun and do other things. Uh, there's actually a number of uh, Amish individuals, Amish women, who help my dad every year on the farm plant the tomatoes. And many years ago, I was helping in that process and I came just a few minutes late one particular morning. And those Amish women, they never let me forget it. The entire rest of the summer, they gave me a hard time about oversleeping and not showing up on time. I'm reminded of that because that's a little bit of what we're talking about here this morning uh, with the people of God, that, that yes, they're human and they laugh and they cry and everything else, but also they're adhering to particular rules and rituals in order to preserve their culture. And the top enforcers of that culture are these Pharisees, the religious leaders here today. They keep an eye on the law and they do their best to make sure everybody's following that law. And so here today, what they're doing is they are accusing Jesus and his disciples of not following the law, 
which again, doesn't sound like the biggest deal to you and I, but it's a significant charge being brought against Jesus and his followers. Today, if you and I break the law, that's not good. We might go to jail, but here to break the law, it was more than moral failure. It represented a breaking away from God, which was the most significant thing that a human being could do in the eyes of the Pharisees. Now, by this point in the Gospel of Mark, Jesus already has a pretty good following. He is creating an ever larger problem for the Pharisees because more and more people are following Jesus, and that is disrupting the status quo of the Pharisees. Now, I realize most of us don't like change in general. Uh, just ask my kids anytime that they ask to borrow my car which puts me out of my normal routine and my normal schedule and to make other arrangements so they can take my car and I might take one of theirs, uh, I don't oftentimes receive that the best. That one small change in my normal schedule, I don't react the best to. Now, the Pharisees, they were over the top in not expecting or accepting change. And so they were only too happy to find charges against this Jesus who was disrupting their status quo. And we hear some of this encounter today in Mark chapter 7, verse 5. So the Pharisees and the teachers of the law asked Jesus, why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders instead of eating their food with defiled hands? So here they're noting the change and they're having a hard time with it. And we see the response from Jesus is anything but nice. Now, I don't know the exact tone that Jesus uses here. I don't know the exact emotions Jesus may have felt, but it sure feels to me like there is some significant sting in the words that Jesus offered. Maybe even a bit of sarcasm on Jesus' part, uh, certainly some bite in his response. Listen to his clap back of the Pharisees here today. We hear, Jesus replied, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites. As it's written, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. You have let go of the commands of God and you are holding on to human traditions. And then Jesus continued, you have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your own traditions. For Moses said, honor your father and mother, and anyone who curses their father or mother is to be put to death. But you say that if anyone declares that what might have been used to help their father or mother is Corbin that is devoted to God, then you no longer let them do anything for their father or mother. Thus, you nullify the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down. And you do many things like that. Can you just hear some of the bite that Jesus is offering? He's saying to these religious leaders, these Pharisees of the day, y'all are a bunch of hypocrites. You are a bunch of self-serving, scripture-twisting fakes. And you're using God's law for your own advantage. And you do it a lot. Now, I gotta admit, there's a part of me that loves this response from Jesus to these Pharisees. I, I love his raw reaction to them. Almost any time we hear about the Pharisees in Scripture in relation to Jesus, it's, it's so often not good. They're part of, the, part of the bad guys often who come at Jesus. They always seem to be on the lookout to try to get Jesus or trap Jesus or take him down. And who doesn't like to see the bad guy get theirs? Well, here Jesus is giving some smackdown to the bad guys so they get theirs. And from my human perspective, I, I think it's kind of fun to see. In other places in Scripture, Jesus is even more explicit in what he is sharing towards the Pharisees. In fact, some of the strongest, most condemning language that Jesus ever uses towards anyone is towards the Pharisees. For example, in Matthew chapter 23, we hear this. And I got to admit, again, some of my most favorite responses on the part of Jesus to someone. Jesus says, Pharisees, you hypocrites, you are like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of the bones of the dead and everything unclean. He also says, teachers of the law and Pharisees, again, you hypocrites, you build tombs for the prophets and decorate the graves of the righteous. And then we also hear Jesus say, literally calling them, you snakes, you brood of vipers, how will you escape being condemned to hell? 
Jesus is basically saying to the Pharisees, you go to hell if you act like that. It's almost hard to believe Jesus even said some of these things. And again, even though I shouldn't admit it, I kind of like this response from Jesus. Those nasty Pharisees are getting what they deserve from Jesus as Jesus puts them in their place. That feels good. Now, even though this is an intriguing response on the part of Jesus, the real question here is why? Why is Jesus responding so strongly? This isn't the kind, nice, sweet response we might expect. Just as the Pharisees were bringing serious allegations against Jesus, he is giving an equally strong, even stronger response against them. Why? What's really going on here? There's so much that we could say about this, but there's one part in particular I'm going to ask us to focus on. We hear this in chapter 7, verse 15 of Mark. Nothing outside a person can defile them by going into them. Rather, it's what comes out of a person that defiles them. When Jesus does this, he's not talking about a hygiene issue. He's not talking about a physical issue. Instead, he is talking about an inner heart issue issue and condition. And he explains this in verses 21 to 23. For it is from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All these evils come from inside and defile a person. For Jesus, all of this discussion relates to what's going on in the heart. Because the heart is more important than we think. Jesus looks deeply at our heart, that is, within. I wonder today what might be going on even right now in our hearts. Even as we hear this encounter with Jesus and the Pharisees, what's stirring or growing or moving in our own hearts? As I've shared for me, I'm so glad that the Pharisees are publicly getting this response from Jesus. They are the bad guys, as I've said, and I feel like they deserve it. However, it's so easy in doing that to make this about the them in our lives. That is, them out there who get what they deserve. Those out there that maybe we don't like. And of course we like it when they, whoever they are, get what they deserve. And oftentimes it's easier to focus on them and the mistakes of others rather than on myself and any mistakes or blame I might carry. I can't go very long in this scripture, even though I love seeing the Pharisees get theirs. I can't go very long without realizing that of all people that Jesus encounters during his time on earth, all people that he speaks to and offers some of the harshest language he ever offers to another human being, Some of his strongest words of rebuke come against religious leaders. And then I realize I am a religious leader, which means I'm in the very category that Jesus is rebuking so strongly. And then I start to wonder if Jesus could be so upset with those religious leaders, maybe he could be just as upset with me, or at least he could be. How might I be misrepresenting Jesus? How might I be off track from where God desires? What might be going on in my own heart that would be hypocritical or not of God? Those are serious and sobering questions. And maybe even as I offer those words, you start to think, whew, glad I'm not a religious leader. Glad Jesus isn't talking to me that way. But then Jesus continues here this morning. And he says, it's from within a person's heart, any person, that evil thoughts start to come. It's from within that the awful things emerge, which means now all of us fall into this category that Jesus is rebuking because all of us have things in our own hearts out of which evil or awful things can emerge and spring. It means anyone who has a heart can potentially have a heart problem. Not just the Pharisees, not just the religious leaders then, not just the religious leaders today, but rather all people then and all people now who have places deep down in our hearts in which evil, awful things may come. Why? 
Once again, verses 20 to 23, what comes out of a person is what defiles them, for it is from within of a person's heart that evil thoughts come, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All these evils come from inside and defile a person. So what we see here then is that the problem lies within all of us. And suddenly then the penny drops and we find we are all guilty. And here's why this is so significant. We live in a world that specializes on blaming others, blaming those on the outside, blaming anyone but ourselves. We specialize in a world where it is anybody's fault but mine. And I don't know where or when this happened in our culture, but it seems to be the primary issue that we are facing in so many ways right now, that the primary, the number one sin is to not accept blame ourselves. Now, I love watching sports in general. I've shared that with you. I love watching basketball and football and track. I enjoy all of them. Recently, the NBA Finals have been on, and I don't watch a lot of the NBA during the regular season for a whole host of reasons, but when the NBA Finals or playoffs come around, I enjoy trying to watch those games when I can. I've been amazed in recently watching some of those games Every single time, and I mean every time, that a ref makes a call against a player or calls a foul against the player, the player contests it. Every single time the player insists they did not make a foul. Every single time it was not their fault. Every single time they are absolutely innocent. Every single time. (laughs) To the point it sometimes becomes hard to watch. I mean, I can't even imagine anymore watching them play the game, and if a ref makes a call, can you imagine the player saying, oh, good job, ref, you got it right. I really hammered him that time. I totally fouled him. That was my fault, my bad, good call, ref. That's even hard to believe now. And it's the same in football. It's the same in other sports that we watch. Uh, It's the same in our political parties, but it's also true in our own personal lives. We claim that the mistakes we make, which first of all, we don't even say that those mistakes are mistakes a lot of times, but anything that might be perceived as a mistake, it's somebody else's fault. Now, I'm not saying that we don't have unfair things happen to us. I'm not saying it's always our fault. It's not. But part of what Jesus is doing with the Pharisees today and part of what he's doing with us is pointing out how difficult it is to deal with the stuff going on in here in our hearts. Because Jesus says what goes on in here in our hearts, it determines then what happens out here. What happens inside determines what happens outside. And the truth is, it is way easier for us to blame somebody else for the ills of our lives. I mean, if we go back to the sports analogy, if I'm the one playing, it's way easier to blame my failure of performance on somebody else rather than admit my own shortcoming. But today Jesus says, no, no, stop doing that. Look inside yourselves. Quit proclaiming one thing to the world when your own heart is in disorder. Otherwise, you are just being hypocritical. And Jesus says, I don't like hypocrites. You are misrepresenting me in the process, and I don't take kindly to that. A while ago, there was a pastor And a woman whose husband was an alcoholic asked the pastor to go with her to see a counselor. What can we do to help my husband, asked the woman to the counselor. But the counselor shot back to the woman. Well, if I'm honest, it seems to me you're the one who has the problem. You're the one who's here and upset while your husband doesn't seem to care. He's not even here. So the reality is you have no control over his behavior, but you do have some control over your behavior. You can't control him, but you can control you. You can decide what you will or will not do. You can, as Jesus might say from today's passage, change your heart. You can change your attitude. You can put boundaries in place. Be honest about how maybe you've contributed to his addiction. The truth is you can change your heart even if you can't change your addicted husband. Now, I realize that sounds pretty harsh. That doesn't sound very caring. And I'm not saying that proper action should not be taken to help that husband overcome his addiction. 
But I am saying, what about our own hearts in times of brokenness? What role have we played? What role are we playing? And maybe that's why today we gather for worship. Because when we gather for worship, when we pause, when we bring our focus to God, it's a place and a context where we invite God to get directly to us. We seek to pause long enough to let God be at work in our own hearts. Maybe right now you are caught in a situation you can't change or make better from the outside. You might be unable to change the rest of the world, but with God's help, you can change your heart. And what that means is that the excuse, the devil made me do it, it doesn't always work. Yes, there's evil out there in our world, but we have to come to a place where we also name the evil in our own hearts as well. The hard truth is that there are no evil interactions out in the world that don't first begin inside of ourselves and in our own heart first. Maybe some of you have heard of the wonderful essayist and writer G.K. Chesterton. He was once asked, what is wrong with the world? And he gave this amazing two-sentence response. He said, what's wrong with the world? Me. Some of us are conditioned to think the way that we deal with evil in the world is only through political change or laws or rules or legislation out there. But the evil that we find in the world starts with us in our own hearts. And if we're not serious about transforming our own hearts, we can't be serious about transforming the rest of the world. Perhaps the way to see transformation in the world is to first begin with the transformation of our own heart. And that's what Jesus is going after today. So yes, there's murder out in the world, which grows out of malice in our hearts. There's lying out in the world, but it grows out of the deceit in our hearts. There's adultery out in the world, but it grows out of the lust in our hearts. There is stealing out in the world, which grows out of the envy in our hearts. There is war out in the world, which grows out of the lust for power in our hearts. Which is why Jesus says, are you so dull? Don't you see, there's nothing that enters a person from the outside that can defile them. For it doesn't go into their heart, but into their stomach and then out of the body. In saying this, Jesus declared all foods unclean. He went on, it's what comes out of a person that defiles them. Why is Jesus raging against the Pharisees today in this encounter? This, these Pharisees who want to blame everyone else on the outside rather than dealing with the conditions in their own hearts? Jesus will have none of this, which is why he says in Matthew chapter 7, How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your own eye when all the time there's a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Jesus has little tolerance for hypocrites. All of this then leaves us with the question, so what do we do? How can we fix what's wrong with us? And if we're not careful, this can lead to a sense of despair and overwhelm. Maybe we are thinking, how in the world am I going to be able to handle this? How do I fix myself? Maybe we came into this time of worship thinking we would encounter a few light religious platitudes or lift up a few cheers to feel good about ourselves compared to those nasty Pharisees. But then Jesus comes and turns the conversation back on ourselves to examine our own hearts for a time of self-reflection. And when we do this, we begin to realize the grief that is caused by the wickedness in the world. And so much of that begins with our own misdirected wants in our own hearts. Because it's not what goes into a person that makes them unclean, says Jesus. It's what comes out. We have to really realize how profound this is. We find this nowhere else. No other religion, no other philosophy does this. All other systems, all other religions say the problem's on the outside. Fix the outside, fix everything out there, fix the system, and then you fix the problem. But no system in history of the world has ever worked to fully eliminate murder or theft or adultery. Why? Because those things don't come from the outside, they come from within. And so the only way we have an answer to those things is to deal with what's going inside of ourselves, in our hearts. 
So other religions, they promote fivefold paths of enlightenment or moral pillars to attain and live into, thinking and hoping that will be enough. They think self-effort and discipline will be enough, but it never is. So what do we do then? If the problem is not on the outside, but on the inside, what do we do? How do we fix it? We realize that we don't fix it. We get honest about our own reality and we turn and we fix our eyes on Jesus and realize only Jesus can make the unclean clean. Only Jesus can wash us from the inside out. And that means that we Christians, we don't think so highly of ourselves that we're not part of the problem. And so we walk with a posture of compassion and humility. But at the same time, we don't think of ourselves so lowly that Jesus cannot redeem us. We also then walk in hope and in confidence. And so yet again, we find the tension of the Christian faith of walking in humility and walking in confidence at the same time. This happens when we fix our eyes on Jesus, when we let him make us clean to do what we cannot do on our own. Jesus does what we cannot do ourselves. Jesus makes us clean. And there is a way to be clean. It's to let somebody else make us clean. It's to let somebody else do the washing. In this case, we let Jesus remove the dirt and the grime from our hearts. Ray Dillard was a professor of Old Testament language and uh, literature at Westminster Theological Seminary. In time, he came to be fascinated with a particular Old Testament passage. It was in Zechariah chapter 3 where Joshua the high priest is standing before the angel of the Lord. And as Joshua was standing there, he was dressed in his filthiest clothes. And the angel of the Lord came and told, told him to take off those filthy clothes. The Lord comes and says to Joshua, See, I have taken away your sin. I will put rich garments on you. And then the Lord says a few other things. And then the Lord says to Joshua, and I will remove the sin of this land in a single day. Now this is written in the Old Testament, which means there was only one day that this could be being referred to. And that one day in the life of the people of God in which sin was atoned for was called the Day of Atonement or Yom Kippur. Now you might remember this, we've touched on this at other times, but in the Old Testament, the people had a tabernacle in which God dwelled among the people. There was an outer court where everybody could meet. There was an inner court where only priests could meet. And then there was the Holy of Holies behind a veil in the innermost place. And nobody could ever go into that Holy of Holies space except the high priest one day a year. Now to get ready to go into that one space, one day a year in the Holy of Holies, the high priest would go a week before the Day of Atonement to get away from his family to get ritually clean. He would go there and he would practice to get ready for the atonement. And on the day of atonement, he would stay up all night the night before with others helping him stay awake in order that he could purify himself. And on the day of atonement, he would wash five times from head to foot in public, but behind a screen so that people knew that their representative of God would be absolutely pure. Then he would dress in white linen because again, he had to be pure. And the high priest would make a sacrifice for his own sin, and then he would bathe, and he would make sacrifices for others. Then he would bathe again. They would take two goats. They'd put all the sins of the people on one goat and send that goat out into the wilderness, literally where we get the term scapegoat from, and then the other goat would be sacrificed. In Zechariah, we hear the angel say, take off your filthy clothes. What that means in the Hebrew, the word filthy, it means dirt, but it means more than that. It means animal feces. It means possible mildew in the clothes. It means clothes that are ripped and gross in every way. So picture that going on. And what Zechariah is trying to communicate is that this is what we look like before God when we do the washing based on our own conditions. But instead of God smiting Joshua here, we see God welcomes Joshua. God says that God will bring his servant, the Messiah, to eventually bring cleansing to the land. And what will happen? Jesus will be the sacrifice for the cleansing of the land. And you know how he did that? Remember everything I just said about what the Old Testament priests did. Jesus is going to do everything the Old Testament priest did that I just described, except in reverse. Jesus, rather than get clean, gets dirty. 
He gets dirty for all of us. He takes on our filth, our mildew, our grossness. Jesus also showed up one week before the sacrifice. He spent a week of preparation, riding into Jerusalem and having final meals and sharing in the final teachings. But on his final night, he stayed up all night. There was no one to help him through the night. He was abandoned in his time of need. And Jesus was not given a perfume to be made clean in bathing. His bath was the spit that was spit upon him. And Jesus wasn't given nice new garments. He was stripped of his garments. And Jesus had laid on him the filth, the grossness, the excrement of the world. And then he was killed outside of the camp, among the skulls, in a place of defilement. Why? So that we could be clothed in linen so that we could be made clean, so that we could have the stains on our own hearts removed, so that we could be declared clean in the sight of God. Today, let's let that reality sink in so that we don't continue to live hypocritical lives, pretending that we don't have our own dirt and filth in our own lives. Today, let's stop trying to do it ourselves and let's surrender to the one who can make us clean. Let us encounter the risen Savior who reminds us it's from the inside that we are made clean and that Jesus loves us enough to tell us what is true. He cares enough to tell us what is true so that we can be set free, so that we don't have to continue living in the dirt and under the weight of the guilt that comes with that dirt. Today, let's encounter the risen one, the one who makes us clean and gives us hope and showers us with his love so that we can rejoice in that reality. Today, what blame do we need to give to God? Today, what part of being a hypocrite do we need to give to God? Where do we need to confess, but then also, where do we need to receive the grace and the goodness and the cleansing of God? And today, may we receive those things so that our hearts might be made clean. And we together can live in the goodness of God. Thanks be to God who loves us so much that he came that he might cleanse our sins and we live in his goodness and his grace. As we get ready to go this day, I invite us go in the name of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, living in humility, confessing before God, but also living in confidence that you walk in the light of the risen Savior who makes us clean. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Amen. Thank you again for joining us for worship today. If you're new here and you'd like to connect more or you'd like to learn more about what's going on here at the church, be sure to check out us on the First Church website or on our app. We also have a weekly newsletter that you can sign up for, and we're also on Facebook and Instagram. Thanks so much again for spending part of your morning with us, and we hope that you have a blessed week.